I'll show you some of the basic of genomics, which involves some uh, uh, genetics and quantitative genetics to understand what we call the breathing value. And then uh, some statistical models that are needed to estimate this and to predict this breathing value. Uh, there are some formulas. Don't worry about that. The idea of the genomic is the one that I more or less explained, and already Jessica explained to you what is why genomic selection. These are the five themes here. The basic quantitative genetics, how to predict breathing values, models for G by E, and then some results, actual results in CIMIT in wheat, as well as maize. Uh, if you know genomic selection, you can skip all the teams and wait until the last one. <laughs> so that's uh, why genomic selection, like Jessica said, is uh, basically this is the formula. You see, I need to use my glasses because I don't see unless I. This is a formula for the annual rate of genetic gain. This is the accuracy of the prediction. We represent the breathing value as u, and this is the predicted breathing value, and this is the correlation between the observed and the predicted ones. This is the, uh, the standard uh, genetic standard deviation. This is intensity of selection. And these are the generation interval. We know that the pedigree blab yield high accuracy. But you know, the breeders they need a lot of replicates for that. And a high cost of phenotyping. And increase the generation interval. So all is here. So when we increase this, you know, the the genetic progress decrease. And uh, also, the genomic selection offers the possibility of obtaining high accuracy of the prediction. The genomic selection allows to have this more or less, uh, depending on the trait and the heritability of the trait, more or less high. So that's, those are some of the reasons why genomic selection is important. A more familiar formula is this one when we have the I is the intensity of selection. This is a standard phenotypic. This is the additive genetic variance. This is the interval, years required for completing a cycle. And this is the schema square P, which is a family. This is the family mean. It's given by the variance of the line, the variance of the line by environment. And this is the residual. Maybe you are more familiar to this formula than to the previous one. If you have any question, you please stop and ask me. No problems. You know, you don't need to know all this if you don't want to, but you can ask any question and I will be able to answer yes or no. I don't know. You know, things here sometimes in genomics may not be as clear as in other fields like GWAS and all this. Why genomic selection? Well, one of the reasons is that we can, uh, we can predict the breeding value at the seed level when, before birth. And we will see that the breeding value uh, represents the genetic merit of an individual, which is given by twice the average deviation of its offspring from the population mean. So, we calculate, we have the plants, and we have replicated field trials. This cost on time, and some cases not even possible. Genomic selection offers an alternative. It offers an alternative to this. And we can, I will explain what is the Mendelian sampling, but it's basically the sampling from the parents of the genes from the two parents that we obtain when we cross A by B. And the time and money are two potential benefits. 
we will see this and we will try or I will try to explain more or less what do we do for that. The traditional plant breeding, the response to selection depends on the time to evaluate the Mendelian sampling in animals or in, in plants we use the replicated field trials where we compare full sieves or half sieves or related lines. Intensity of selection is very costly and we usually or traditionally we use the progeny testing, right? We use the progeny testing which is expensive and the accuracy is, is not one. Why genomic selection is attractive? Because it will exactly assess the time, the intensity of selection, and the accuracy. So this is why it's very attractive way to, to do breathing, or not to do breathing, just to use genomic as a tool. You have the reference population. I put animals because I borrowed this slide from John Hickey, and he's an animal. I mean, an animal breeder, not an animal. <laughs> well, sometimes he acts like an animal, but he's not. <laughs> yeah. So this is the reference population. Reference population has genotypes, markers, and phenotypes, things that you have seen. The individuals, you have seen the, the, you know, the, the weight of these animals or the grain yield of the plant. Then you have the selection candidates that have only markers, genotype, no phenotype, markers. And then, you know, usually on the, on the traditional breeding, we do a progeny test here because we want to see how the candidates, they perform. In genomic selection, we develop a, an equation here, a prediction equation based on these phenotypes and on these markers here and here, we develop a question, a prediction equation. We, we predict the breeding value, and then we select the animals or the plants with the highest breeding value. Well, it looks very simple, but it's not like that. But genomic selection, well, you know, there's nothing magic here is used for complex traits, for simple traits with a few genes you don't need very sophisticated or very many markers. But usually for complex traits, grain yield is a complex trait, low heritability, high marker density, assuming the markers are cheap. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, <coughs> Only genomic selection, only few cycles, because it has been shown that genomic selection decrease genetic variance very rapidly. We'll never substitute phenotypic selection because when you do phenotypic selection, you, you, you select for everything. You select for epistasis, for all gene effects, and uh, it's, not, uh, it's not possible to beat phenotypic selection you can beat phenotypic selection by unit of time. Because you, you don't do the progeny test, you do the marker and use the markers and select. So you save a year. And you know, the precise phenotyping across environments is fundamental. So I say this because, because you might, you know, uh, finish in the workshop and say, oh, genomic selection is a miracle. No, it's not. I mean, it's, it's another tool. And it's very useful, at least for SIM it has been very useful. So this is the first thing. Okay. If you have any question, you can ask now because I'm going to go now to the next, to the next subject. Something on quantitative genetics um, and uh, 
on quantitative genetics and uh, and developing the breathing value, okay? Everything is clear now, up to here? If you have taken courses on, on population genetics and quantitative genetics, then you know this, but I don't know if everyone knows this. So I will explain this basic equation. You have in genetic, we have the genotypes, the genes or the markers, these can be markers. This is homozygous, heterozygous, homozygous from the other side. You define these genotypic values. If you read, if you read Cockerham, Kempthor, Garner, but Rex Bernardo, they use, they use different, different values here. Some guys, they use U instead of Z. I'm following here what Rex Bernardo has in his book. So these are the genotypic values represented by Z for these homozygous, Z and A. This is the, exactly the mid, the middle between the two homozygous. This is the heterozygous where you have A and D, and this is Z plus 2A. You can calculate here the mid parent. The mid parent is just the average between the two homozygous, right? This is A22 plus A11 divided by 2. This is equal to Z plus A. Therefore, another way to represent the genotypic value is the mid parent minus A, the mid parent which is 0 here, the mid parent plus D, and the mid parent and A. And another way to put the coded genotypic value is minus A, 0, D, and A, where D represents the dominance, the degree, the different degree of dominance, right? And A, A is the half difference between the two genotypic values of the two homozygous. All right? So A is the additive effect of one locus, D is the level of dominance. So this is, if you more or less remember the, the, that the genotypic value of this individual is, is called minus A, the heterozygous is D and the other one is A. If you remember this, you will then uh, remember how to calculate the print value. I am showing this in order to come up at the end with how do we calculate the breathing value based exactly on the genotypic values and the allele frequency, because we need to include allele frequency. The population mean for one locus model is simply the genotype, their frequency, if they are in hardy wimber equilibrium, and you know that this is never, well, not never, but occasionally is not true, assuming Hardy Wimber, but we assume Hardy Wimber. And don't ask. You assume Hardy Wimber and believe me that it is going to work. So and P is the frequency of the A1 allele, and Q is the frequency of the A2 allele. So the heterozygous is 2PQ. These are the genetic values that we already seen. Uh, this is A, D, and minus A if you want to call it like that. There are two ways to present the genotypic values. This is the mid parent. The mid parent is C plus A, so we usually correct everything by the mid parent. So the population mean is just the, is only the multiplication of the frequency of the allele and the genotypic value, right? So you multiply the frequency of these homozygous with the genotypic value, the frequency of, of the heterozygous with the, by the genotypic value, and then the, the value of the homozygous multiplied by its frequency. So if you work out this, you end up with this formula, which is the mid parent plus the contribution of the homozygous 
and the contribution of the heterozygous. If you have more than one locus, you have many loci, you add them up, right? You add these components. You add the components of the mid-parent, the component of the homozygous, the component of the heterozygous in this way. Is this more or less clear or is complicated? If it is complicated, I can explain again. If it is clear, I continue. Now, the parents, they pass on alleles, not their genotypes, right? So we need a measure that Marx referred to the alleles or the genes, not to the genotype. A and D and minus A are functions of the genotypes, not from the alleles. We say, if the individual is A1, A1, then the genotype is A. If it is this, the genotype is D. If it is this, the genotype is minus A. But we need to have and to express the effect of individuals' alleles. And we can express the allele effect on the mean of the individuals that have that particular allele. And this is what Fisher did. Fisher said, well, I, I will try to express how much deviation from the population mean this allele will cost in the progeny. So that will give me an idea of the effect of the allele. So this is, so he developed this idea of the average effect of an allele. On what? On the mean of the individuals that have that particular allele, right? So it's the average deviation from the population mean of the individuals that receive that particular allele, all right? The other allele is coming random from the population. So that is the, that is the idea on the average effect of an allele. I mean, this is, you know, it's an abstract idea, but it's very, very useful. But now the idea is just to put this in terms of the genotypic code values and the mid-parent heterosis. For example, the average effect of the allele A1, which is represented by alpha 1, is the probability of mating with another allele A1 which is p, because the frequency of A1 is p. And the resultant genotype A1, A1, has a genotypic value, which is the mid-parent and A, because it's A1, A1. The probability of mating with an allele, which is A2, and A2 is in the population at a frequency of q, then the resultant genotype is the heterozygous A1, A2 with the genotypic value, the mid-parent and D. And the same, <coughs> the same with, um, so then the mean genotypic value of the, of the offspring will have represented by alpha 1 and is is this quantity, this genotypic value by, by the probability, this genotypic value by the probability, and this is equal to alpha 1, the mid pattern, the effect of, of the allele frequency of A1, and, and A, which is the uh, genotypic value of, of the homozygous, and this is the heterozygous. So this this is a representation of the average effect of an allele, right? The same with allele A2. It can be done exactly the same. Then we can put all this into this equation, right? Because the average effect of allele 1, we should express this as a deviation from the population mean, which is this one that was what we have found before. So the average effect of the allele 1 a1 is Q multiplied by alpha. And this alpha is this quantity. And remember this quantity. Remember this quantity. Because this quantity is called 
This alpha quantity is called the effect of the allele substitution that we will see now. And the same with the average effect of A2. We can express that as an alpha 2, which is minus P alpha. Okay? So the average effect of an allele depends on the genotypic value, A and D, and depends on the allele frequency. So that, that is population dependence, you see. Because one population may have one allele frequency, other population may have another allele frequency. So we might have different allele frequency for different populations. So the mean change that is produced would be the average effect of an allele at gene substitution. So this is, this is the other concept that, uh, this is the other concept that uh, Fisher developed. I'm sorry, I, I passed this slide. So the average effect of an allele is, the for not, is therefore not only a property of the allele itself, but it's a joint property of the allele and the population in which that allele is found. The average effect of an allele substitution is, ex well, it's similar to the average effect of an allele, but it's when we, we substitute an allele. When, when the breeder goes and says, no, I want that plant and that and that and that, is doing exactly this. It's doing an allele substitution because it's, it's, it's replacing something for something. When the breeder will say, I'm going to cross this with that, it's exactly replacing alleles from one parent or from one population you know, to the other one. The change in the mean of the following of the offspring when the maternal allele is changed you know, to a different allele and the paternal allele is a random allele from the population. That is the idea. And this is the formula. But you see that this alpha is exactly A plus D and Q minus P. And this is, and this is the average effect of an allele substitution. If you, now, so how do you define the breathing value? You define the breathing value in terms of the average effect, alpha 1 and alpha 2, the average effect of an allele substitution. So A1, A1 has an average effect of an allele substitution, which is 2 times alpha 1, which is equal to this quantity here. <coughs> the heterozygous is alpha 1 and alpha 2, which is this quantity. And the homozygous is this quantity. And the breathing value expresses the value transmitted from the parents you know, to the offspring. So the expected breathing value of an individual is the average of the breathing value of their parents. It cannot be anything different than that, right? We are similar to what our parents who are, are right? So, <clears throat> so the breathing value of the spring has one half, or the mean of the breathing value of the parent one, and the breathing value of the parent two. Now, this, this quantity here that I showed before, this quantity here, A plus D and Q minus P, can be obtained doing this linear regression as an average effect of an allele substitution. And you can see this in, in Falconer page number, I don't know, 51 or something. If you, you know, the linear regression is, is the covariance between x and y, or y and x, over the variance of x. The y in this particular case is the genotypic value of the genotypes. And x is the allele content. It might be 0, 1, or 2. If you, depending on your reference, it could be, if your reference is, is A1, then the genotype A1, A1 has two alleles. A1, A2 has one allele. A2, A2 has zero allele. All right? So if you have these, the frequencies here, 
if you have the genotypic values here, like we already seen, and then the, this is the allele content, then the regression, you can calculate this, which is the covariance of yx over the variance of, of x. And I'll show you the formulas here, but the formulas we use is just the summation of the frequency multiplied by the cross product. This is the covariance. This is sample covariance between x, y, and x minus the expected value of x and the expected value of y. If you put all this into this equation from the previous table, then you end up that the covariance is equal to 2 times pq alpha. And the variance on the allele content is this, given by this formula, which is a standard formula for the variance. You multiply this and you get 2 pq, right? So the regression, if you put these formulas, the regression of this is this over this. And this over this gives you the breathing value or the allele effect substitution A plus D and Q minus P. And this is a very, and this is the quantity we want to predict, period. That's it. This is the quant, but, and what is the P and Q? Well, the P and Q are the, are the frequencies of the markers. That's why now with the markers, with high density markers, we know the genotype. Before was, you know, a sort of, you know, very abstract concept. So the basic genetic model can be represented by this. You have the genotypic value of A sub I, A sub J, which is equal to mu and the genetic effect. But the genetic effect is the summation of the breathing value of the parent I and the parent J, plus a deviation here that might be due to dominance or other genetic effect. But so this small uh, genetic, uh, this genetic effect G sub I J is equal to the summation of the allele substitution due to parent I and to the other parent and the deviation. When you have two locus, you need to add this. So you have this effect for one locus, this effect for the other locus with the other deviation. This particular may be the epistasis, uh, but we don't talk about this. This is a formula that you have seen in Falconer many, many times. What do you have here? Well, here on the y-axis, you have the genetic value. A, D, 0, and minus A. Those are the coded genetic values, right? What do we have on the x? This is the allele content, 0, 1, and 2. This is the homozygous, heterozygous, homozygous on the other side. And these are the, uh, the frequencies, if assuming they are in hardy wimber equilibrium. This is the, the regression of the allele content. This is the breathing value, the, which is regress on the, <coughs> on the allele content. And this is the coefficient of regression, which is given exactly the breathing value of that individual, which is a covariance between this and the variance of the x-axis, which is given by this formula, and this will give you exactly this uh, uh, breathing value. Alpha is the additive effect of the gene, also known as the average effect of allele substitution. Now, alpha captures part of the variance generated by the dominance, because the dominance is here. And it depends, and you see that depends, the breathing value depends on the allele frequency of the population and depends on the genotypic frequency. So it's very, it's very population dependent, right? So can we use the Sorry? Can we use the previous slide? Oh, yes, the previous slide. This one? Yeah. This one? No. This one, yeah. You want to? Yes. Yes. So I, I am painfully aware that this might be a really stupid question, but I got stuck on the detail because in a previous slide you said that the 
average effect of an allele was dependent on P and Q, the allele frequencies. And mathematically, that probably, but in, in a biological sense, or in the field, how does that, why does the effect, why is that dependent on the frequency of the allele? Well, yeah, because, because you might have, let's say, you might have one population of individuals which are coming from one cross A and B. And you might say, okay, this is, this is my population and, and, and has, this particular population has no structure because it's A and B and you have the cross at the F2, 3 level. Now, if you have, but now, so the alleles, they might have certain frequency there. But if you have another cross C by D, they might have different allele frequency depending on the parents. But would that imply that the, the average effect of the allele actually doesn't involve only that allele, but that there is actually sort of... No, it, it involves the alleles for all the markers, for all the, for all the genes. Imagine if it's fixed, then it has no effect, right? If it is fixed, Maybe one allele is one. The other one is zero. <laughs> From the biology point of view, plant to plant communication, systemic acquired resistance, salicy, salicylic acid, communicate. So, is it answers your question? You, you, you have, you know, you, you change the allele frequency by doing selection, right? And the breeders, they do that. Uh, so, it's, it's a population dependent. That doesn't mean that you need to then, then, you say, well, how do I do this in real practice? I'm telling the concept here that is, is the breathing value, the thing that we want to predict is affected by, obviously, by the structure of the population. Yeah. Right? And, uh, and, uh, and, if you, and, and also of the genotypic value, but but it's a joint effect. It's not uh, something that you you say, well, this is, if some of the alleles are fixed, well, if some of the alleles are fixed, P is one or Q is one and the other one is zero. But this is for one gene. When you have multiple genes, then you, then, then you have this for each of the cases. Right? So it's not exactly you know, conceptually, this is important because sometimes you might have, when you look at the markers and you do, you do a sort of uh, decomposition of the marker matrix, you see two groups or three groups. You don't see one group of, of individuals there. So the markers are telling you that you have two or three populations. There are different ones. I don't know. You know, if you if you mix if you mix population and you have population one, two, and three, and you put and you marker all the populations, you are gonna distinguish those very very clear in the in the heat map. That doesn't mean that you need to separate each population and end it up maybe with three individuals here. No, this is the concept. This is the conceptual part of the breathing value that, the one, that we want to predict. That depends on the allele frequency of the population and depends on the genetic value of the population. Okay? You, you wanted to see this? Okay. So the breathing value, <coughs> the additive values in G represent the average additive effect of a gene. One individual received from one part and from both parts. Half and half. So each parent contributes half of the genes, and this is this sort of transmitting ability is one half of the additive genetic value. Okay. Now the breathing value itself has two has two components. One is the the, uh, the alleles we receive from my, pa uh, my mother and my father, right? But the same for my brother or for my sister, the same 
So this is the average of the parents, of my parents. But then there is another component, which is the Mendelian sampling, because not my brother is different than me, you know. And that particular Mendelian sampling is important in, in, in genomics. So the breathing value of, of the eye individual is given by one half the breathing value of the mother and father and a deviation which is due to the Mendelian sampling. So A, the breathing value of mother and father, they, they are called the parental average. And M is the deviation of the breathing value of that individual from the average of the breathing value. And this is called Mendelian sampling. OK? So let's, let's talk about these two components a little bit now. The pedigree relationship will capture this parental average. And it's captured in this metric that is called A, which is a numerical relationship metric. That is built using the pedigree. And it's the relationship between each pair of individuals. You know, the breeders, they use a nomenclature to say, this individual is coming from the cross A by B. And then they, they self the cross, so they put a, something there, a sign saying this is the cross. Then they cross this self with another individual. So they, they use this nomenclature to represent what has happened in that particular individual. So this is the pedigree. When I say pedigree, this is, this is, what, this is what I mean. Now, what this represents exactly, the, I can take that um, and, and calculate the relationship between the individual. Because if, this, if these five individuals are coming from one cross, they are full sieves. So they are full sieve. They, they have a pedigree. They have a relationship, which is 0 0.5. Why? Because each of them, they receive half from one part and half from the other one. But then you, you know, usually we multiply this, this the coefficient of parentage by two and obtain this matrix A that range, range from zero to two. Uh, in, inbred individuals, they have a relationship equal to one because we multiply by two, we have two there. A pair of individuals unrelated, they are zero, full C if they are zero, five, half C if they are zero, two, five, right? So this is the pedigree gives this component of the component of the breathing value, which is due to the, the parental average. Right? The Mendelian sampling, well, the Mendelian sampling is exactly is a sampling process that implies that each of the parents they passes one half of their genes, but but in each meiosis, you know, not exactly the same material will pass by. You know. So the Mendelian sampling is, is, is something that will be, will help in genomic selection because it's exactly the Mendelian sampling in the traditional manner will have, in order for you to distinguish between brothers and sisters, you need to put the seed in the field and wait six months. Period. There is no other way to do it. With the markers, you, you can account for the, this Mendelian sampling without having to go and put the seed in the field. And the Mendelian sampling is this. Let's say you have, we have, a, <clears throat> we have one parent here, and then you have other parents coming. So this is, this is a, a, a half seed family. This is the child one, two, three, and four. This is why, you know, this is why I'm different from my brother or from my sister because, because we are not the same, although we, we are half sieves, right? And in theory, you can have sieves that are genetically un unrelated in theory. So the, gen the, the genomic relationship, you know, some individuals are more equal than others, even 
even if the additive genetic relationship is the same. You see, these are the half sips, these are the full sips, these are unknowns. But the half sips, they are not exactly 0 0.25. They, there is a range of individuals. Now, if you have only the pedigree, you might have different values because the parents may or may not be related. And that is why the half sips are not exactly 0 0.25. This is why the full sips are not exactly 0 0.5, because if the parents are related, they will be la you know, higher than 0 0.5. If the parents are not related, they might be 0 0.5 or less. So the actual half sieve relationship but you see, these are relationships. These are the relationship between the individuals. Because here, I mean, breeding is we select the progeny of individuals that, that are related. The, in this generation are the parents, and these are the progeny. I mean, we, we don't say, these are the parents, these are the parents of other individuals. What is the relationship between them if the parents are not related? Zero. So the breeders say, no, no, I cannot, I cannot select these parents and predict whatever is happening in another breeding program. Yes? Uh, how do you address that, uh, for example, if you, if you have pedigree like A by B, mm. immediately you cross with C, that's like top cross. Yeah. And if you have A by B and inbreeding, for example, A by B, C, and then one line you cross with C. Right. So the pedigree will be same. No, but you put in, in, in your pedigree, you put the number of, of selfing that you are doing, right? You may have A by B by C, selfing one time, two times, three times. I don't know how you represent this or how the breeders represent that. I, I know because in CIMIT, in the maze program, they are discussing this, you see, because they don't have a, as clear nomenclature that they have in wheat in CIMIT. So the maize program and now they are realizing the importance of the of, of the of the parental relationship. So they are, but there has to be some sort of of, of uh, agreement on how you will call this A by B by C and selfing. And you need to call it exactly the same as Matthew called it, or or Ravi or or Karim because because you need to have exactly the same relationship between the individuals when you have the same nomenclature. This is the genomic prediction. We will see what is this GBLAB, but not now. But I, I give you an example. We have, let's say that we have data on plant one. This is the plant one. With progeny, the plant two, and three. The plant four is unrelated. The plant four is unrelated. And we want to predict the plant five. But the plant five is a progeny from plant one. Okay? So we we have this A matrix based on pedigree. So these two guys are full sips because they are coming, well, we assume they are coming from the same, from the same two parents, right? The plant four is unrelated and plant five is again family of plant two and, and, and three. Now, if we have this matrix based on the relationship, these are the numbers. Well, here it should, I said before, should be two here, but but the but uh, the relationship between one individual with itself is one. The relationship between these two is 0 0.5 because they are half full sips. Now the G matrix based on markers or DNA based matrix may not be exactly the same, and actually this the plan for maybe is relatively low related with the others that the pedigree does not give this relationship, you see? 
So the plant B, the plant 4, has some relationship between the others that we didn't know. Based on pedigree, we didn't know. Based on markers, yes. So the blabs of these, if you calculate the blabs, the best linear and bias predictor, you get coefficients here, but you don't get the coefficient of, of, of plant 4 because, you know, because you don't have the plant 4. I don't know why it's, it keeps on moving. Your laptop has <laughs> life, by, life by its own. And, uh, but here in the GIB lab, we see that the, the coefficient of the plant 4 is 0 0.005. You might say, well, but this is 0. Well, maybe no. Maybe no. It's not 0, obviously. 0 0.0059. 519. So the DNA gives an extra information that we don't have on the pedigree. So, so the blab uses the family information. The blab using A metric has the family information. The G blab uses the family information and will, will account for the segregation within family. And this is why I said before, the, the markers will give us an idea on how is the variability within a family. The pedigree will tell us how is the relationship between the parents, OK? And how the, and how the family information is related to the plan number four, which is supposed to be unrelated to everyone else. So the prediction of the breathing value <coughs> is very important in any, in any breathing program. And method for predicting breathing value depends on the type and amount of information available on the candidate of selection. So in order to predict the breathing value, we have data from the phenotypic data, data from the pedigree that will help us on the parental average, and also data from the markers that measure the Mendelian sampling of difference between individuals within a family. It was until 2001 that McWhison was the first one to show how to use the markers in order to predict the breathing values, using all markers, not only markers which are related to the trade. They might not be related to the trade. We don't know, but use all markers. And they put, and they put the marker into this linear model, which is addition. You put, this is the additive effect of the SNP. It's linear because you add them up. This is the effect of the allele, of the chromosome or the haplotype. This is the marker effect, and this is the residual, which is taking non-genetic effect. And then uh, Bernardo. And John Bean, they published this paper, 2007, where they show how, by simulation, how to, using all markers, can give a prediction, a good prediction of the breathing value. Now you, now, now you might start asking questions, say, why? Why to use all markers? Some markers are not related to anything. Why you use those markers? They might or might not be related. You don't know. Right? Especially for grain yield, you don't know. Maybe for flowering, you know very well, or maturity, but for grain yield, no. So there are various ways doing genomic prediction. You might use A or you might use G. You might use the relationship matrix, or you might use G, or you might use both, A and G. So this is a standard mixed model equations for getting the blobs using the A matrix, the additive relationship matrix. This is the mixed model. Oh, I'm sorry. What is happening here? What did you do, Jessica? <laughs> <laughs> Look at this. Uh, but, well, but this is, this is 
But uh, this is a PDF, right? Yeah. Well, doesn't matter. But this is so. This is a mixed model equation using the G matrix, using markers. So this is another way to do genomics, or another way to do genomics is using both G and A. So this is the genomic relationship matrix, consists of estimated relationship between individuals based on all markers. I'm sorry, I need to talk here as well. So based on genomic relationship, uh, uh, genomic relationships based on markers, OK? And this is the end for this particular theme. You. Uh, okay. I will present next. I will present statistical method and some of the complexities for estimating the breathing values when we use a large number of markers. The, you know, the main problem is, I mean, the complication comes because you have more markers than individuals most of the time, right? Because markers are cheap. So you might have, I don't know, you might have maybe a 20,000 markers, but you don't have 20,000 individuals, you have less. So statistically, you cannot use the standard ordinary least square to estimate the breathing value. You cannot because the ordinary least square will say, ah, what do I do now? I don't know what to do now. It's like, you know, it's like, okay, I will bring Jessica and Lee order one pizza for all of us like this. <laughs> wow. That's lunch, <laughs> But how do we, eat? well, we take a small piece of pizza and I eat this. <laughs> Jessica eat a small piece. But if we bring a big pizza, we can eat more. That's exactly what is happening in genomics when you have so many markers that you need to say, no, no, some of these markers, they need to go to zero because otherwise I cannot estimate their effect. They, they must be zero. And some of them are zero. And so that's the, that's the thing that we will see after lunch. You eat a pizza, don't worry about the number of markers. <laughs> <laughs>